Time now for yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he's just an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense accounts submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar to Frederick Kimball, General Manager of Fine Arts Insurers Incorporated, New York, New York. The following is an accounting of my expenditures in the investigation of the stolen portrait of the Duke of Masson. Or, who opened the season on canvas back Duke? <laughs> Expense account, item one. $350, plane fare, New York to London. Item two, $125, replacement, brand new light tan top coat, borrowed and not returned by fellow passenger during flight. We had cleared Gander, Newfoundland, and were four hours out, flying at 20,000 feet over the Atlantic, with a knife in the weather, fighting it out to see which could darken the sky first. Most of the passengers were asleep, but the rough weather was giving the man in the seat beside me a rough time. Although the plane had leveled off, his dinner was still trying to gain altitude. Among other things, he complained of chills, so I slipped out of my top coat and threw it around his shoulders. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry to be such a bother. Oh, oh, I... I think I'll try a drink of water. Okay, I'll bust the steward. No, don't bother. She's up forward. Maybe the walk back will do me some good. I'll be right back. I'll be here. <laughs> My seatmate had carried his constitutional too far. He stepped out for a breath of fresh air. I didn't think anybody could get sick enough to do that. By the time I got to the back of the ship, the rear seat passengers were milling around the aisle, all of them claiming not to know anything about what had happened. I didn't either. But if my ex-friend hadn't out of the plane, he'd been pushed. And that posed this tantalizing question. If he'd been pushed, and since he'd been wearing my light tan top coat, was I the one who was supposed to be taking that 20,000-foot swan dive into the Atlantic? I looked over the passengers, and to me, they all looked guilty. But I knew they couldn't be. I also knew I had no chance of finding out which one was. When things settled down, everybody started asking the stewardess for sedatives to help them get back to sleep. I asked her for some black coffee to keep awake. By four o'clock the next afternoon, I was in good health in London and in the office of your policyholder, Dexter Morley. Yes, I've been expecting you, Dollar. Your company cabled that you were coming. And very generous of them to send you all the way over here to help. The way I have to pay at my expense account to make an honest living. Don't ever accuse my clients of generosity. Oh? No? Oh, no. They aren't being soft-hearted benefactors. They're being hard-headed businessmen. If that painting stays lost, it'll cost them $250,000. Well, I'd better brief you from the beginning. Oh, if I yawn during your story, Morley, don't mind. I'm just sleepy. I see. Very well, I'll make a brief, Dollar. Well, during my lifetime, I have developed an overwhelming appreciation for fine painting. Unfortunately, I have not been able to develop the fortune that should go with it. As a result, I haven't only not been able to any great paintings, I've not been able to afford to travel to the museums around the world where the great masterpieces hang. Well, I guess there must be a lot of people stuck in the same fix. Exactly, and that's what gave birth to my plan. I have organized what you might call the Masterpiece of the Month Club. Its members are 12 of the top museums and galleries in the world. This plan calls for them to rotate their most famous paintings. In other words... If the people can't afford to come to the pictures, my scheme brings the pictures to the people. A new one, every month. Oh, well, that's very interesting, Mr. Morley. But uh, let's talk about the one that got away. Oh, yes, of course. I was merely outlining the background of this case to delineate my responsibility in the matter. Well, so now we know that you feel personally responsible for the loss of the painting, even though it's well insured. Mr. Dollar, no amount of money can get that picture repainted by the man who originally painted it. The artist Bonnet has been dead for more than 300 years. Oh, a real gone guy. Well, if we fail to recover Bonnet's masterpiece, the Duke of Masson, it would not only be a tremendous shock, but also a tremendous loss to the world of art. Further, it would ruin my reputation. The very first painting to be loaned arrives here in London from Paris four days ago, and the first night after I deliver it to the museum, it is stolen off their wall. Okay, Mr. Morley. 
So much for the story. Where's the museum? It's the new art gallery at Coventry. Uh, here's the address. I won't be able to accompany you myself as I'm flying across the channel immediately to try to calm the officials in Paris, the ones who loaned the stolen painting. Uh, they've been calling incessantly. I'll phone my assistant, Miss Harding, to meet you at the main entrance in the museum in, let's say, uh, 45 minutes. Okay. Tell her I'll be the man asleep on the step. <laughs> Expense account, item three, sixpence halfpenny, London papers. To read while waiting for Miss Harding at museum entrance. No matter what I told Mr. Morley, I was afraid to go to sleep. Page one of each newspaper referred to my reason, the misadventure which had occurred on the plane the night before, a possible attempt on my life. Then along came another good reason for my lids not drooping. Miss Harding was an eye-opener. Speaking in artistic terms, no painter could completely capture her dimension. A sculptor could come closer. As far as I was concerned, so could she. And she did. Would this be Mr. Dollar? It would indeed. I'm Miss Harding. Mr. Morley indicated that I might find you asleep. I say that must have been a shocking experience on the way over. Oh, well, not only shocking, but frustrating. Oh? Yes, there was nothing much that could be done. We searched along enough to drop a few life rafts, some flares, and a big blob of yellow oil to help mark the spot. Then all the pilot could do was call for the air sea rescue boys and hope. Yes, it's been in all the papers the whole day. Poor chap. Yeah, it could be that there, but for the grace of a light tan top coat, go I. What was that? Oh, nothing. Well, uh, shall we go museum prowling? Yes, of course. Uh, well, there isn't much to see, just a blank space on the wall. Well, let's take a look anyway. Hey. Did you see a blank space on the wall? Why, yes. You mean they stole the painting frame and all? Indeed, they did. Oh. Our thieves are doing things the hard way these days. Usually, they just cut the painting out of the frame, stick it under the coat, and make a getaway. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I know. But perhaps this job was done by a beginner, or perhaps the burglar was interrupted and had to make a run for it, frame and all. There are infinite possibilities. Yes, infinite. Thanks. Mr. Dollar... Frankly, I think this trip here to the museum is an utter waste of time. I've gone over the whole situation with a gentleman from Scotland Yard. It wasn't so much as a single fingerprint. Miss Harding, I have yet to solve a case with a fingerprint. Mm, sorry, I forgot. Men just can't stand to be any show of efficiency in a woman. Oh, I wouldn't say that. It's according to what they find their efficiency. I'm speaking of business. Mr. Dollar... I'm sure that I can save you a great deal of trouble. I've already done an extraordinary amount of research on this case. Well, be careful what you tell me, Miss Harding. At this point, I confuse easily. The dollar, a child could understand what I have to tell you. Sometimes a wide-awake child is better than a sleepy man. But go ahead. Uh, now, this is the case, right here. No. There. You see? A blank wall. Now, Mr. Dollar, of the 12 foremost art teams in London, I have discovered that nine are currently in prison, one is in hospital after falling four stories off a roof, and the other two are at large and may be found residing at the addresses I have here. Hey, you sound more like a patron of the criminal courts than you do of the arts. The entire subject of criminology fascinates me. Now, have you seen enough of your blank wall? Yes, yeah, things are blank enough. Give me those addresses. And while you're at it, thank you, you better give me yours. Mr. Dollar, you don't think I look suspicious? Oh, no. Delicious. Expense account, item four. Five shillings. Cab fare to Scotland Yard. Tip to driver, two bob. When it comes to money, I speak all languages. Scotland Yard from the outside looks like a big public school. Well, it has taught a lot of lessons to a lot of people. Inside, it was tea time. When I inquired for the officer in charge of the robbery, with which I was concerned, I was led to an Inspector Carew. First, he gave me a cup of tea, then he gave me my lunch. Mr. Dollar, you sit here and ask me why we haven't done something. Believe me, sir, the yard is not as archaic as its architecture. There's a simple legal procedure which must occur before we can make either an investigation or an arrest. Well? First, a complaint must be lodged by the legal owners of any stolen property. At that point, and at that point only, are we allowed to act. You mean nobody called for help? Well, naturally, when the museum discovered the painting gun, they immediately rang us up. We went, of course, to gather primary evidence. Unfortunately, there was none. Well, what about the owners of the painting, the museum in Paris? As yet, we've heard nothing. We expect to momentarily. Uh, Inspector, just out of curiosity, what about this girl, Miss Harding? I'd say she's, uh, 
Well, uh, a jolly fine type. I mean, do you know anything about her? I say, didn't you Yanks carry off enough of our girls after the war? I'm not in the importing business. I mean, is she known to you professionally? What? You suspect her? Well, not particularly, but uh, she did give me this list. In her opinion, this is the who's who and where they are of your city's light-fingered art lovers. Hmm. Let me see it. <sighs> well, quite complete and quite accurate. Hardly the work of an amateur. Where in the world would a young lady like Miss Harding come into such information? That, Inspector Carew, is exactly what I'm driving at. <laughs> Back in a taxi headed from Scotland Yard on my way to check into the Mount Royal Hotel. I gave my eyes a rest at the risk of missing the sightseeing, but my mind refused to follow suit. It now had three blank walls to stare into. The one in the museum, the one at Scotland Yard, and the most provocative of the three to look at, the girl who knew too much, Miss Muriel Harding. My mind also kept ruffling my nerve ends with a question. Was I supposed to be the guy who got dumped out of that plane the night before? We arrived at the Mount Royal Hotel, and I got my answer. Here we are, sir. That's the Mount Royal, right? Dead on, of course, the way. You can't miss it. Okay. What's the bill? Uh, to you, sir. <laughs> That'll be half a crown. How much? Two and six, sir. Oh, here. You you figure it out. <laughs> God, ever so, Governor. Look out, Governor. Mind that car. Ah, that was a close one. You all right, Governor? Yeah. Blimey, since the cars are back on the street, it's more dangerous to walk around now than it was when them ruddy buzz bombs were dropping. Yeah, a couple of good things about the buzz bombs, though. Nobody aimed them at you personally, and nobody was at the wheel to steer them. That made it official. I had been set up for a pigeon, and it was me somebody had tried to turn into a seagull during that flight across the Atlantic. Expense account item five. Three pounds ten to the bellboy for services rendered. How about that? Fourteen bucks for a bottle of scotch. I knocked off forty winks. It felt like only twenty. Then I grabbed a shower, shave, and a cab down Oxford Street and over to Soho. Expense account item six. Five shillings. The legal limit on the price of dinner in England these days. I ate in a nice place called Ketner's. Dinner being a bit of chicken, three choices of vegetables. Brussels sprouts boiled, Brussels sprouts creamed, and Brussels sprouts roasted. For dessert, I looked at the names and addresses of Miss Harding's two candidates for the boys most likely to have succeeded in swiping the missing portrait of the Duke of Masson. I was in the right district for one of them. I found myself on a dark and lonely muse. That may sound good to you, but in Soho, a muse is still only a place fit for ash cans and cats. I groped my way up the stairs of the address of the number one boy on Miss Harding's list. On a top step, I was breathing hard. I wasn't all from the climb. Clenched my teeth, my knuckles, and knocked on the door. Then I broke roll two, the basic instructions for the working snoop. I opened the door. That lock never went to Yale. The door of a wood-burning stove across the room was open. The flames erratically painting the walls with orange light, then erasing them back into black darkness. I finally dared to breathe. Then I saw what I was looking for, lying on a table, its edges curled upward. An oil painting of a guy with short breeches and a long face. I started forward, but something barred my foot. I stared down at the floor in front of me. First it was pitch black. Then the light from the stove flared up, and I saw that the object was what it, I thought it was and hoped it wasn't. A man wearing his head, and I don't mean his hair, parted in the middle. I rushed across the room, flipped the door off the top of the stove to give me more light, and looked for a telephone. There was none in the room with a corpse, so I tried the door of the next room. And the door I was trying started erupting. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, we want to remind you that those delightful, charming neighbors, Ozzie and Harriet, are coming back home next Sunday night, coming back to CBS. You'll be able to join them on most of these same stations at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time, just before the Jack Benny Show. 
Ozzie and Harriet now have their own sons, Ricky and David, playing themselves in place of the young actors who formerly portrayed them. So make it a party for your whole family when Ozzie and Harriet, Ricky and David, come home with their fun and laughter to CBS next Sunday night. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> bullet came crashing through the door at me, I dropped to the floor. I still don't know whether my knees buckled or I meant to go down. I stayed where I was. But whoever it was on the other side of that door decided to take off. Out the window. I got to my feet, but by the time I kicked the door open and got to the window, I had that old Mother Hubbard feeling. The cupboard was bare. And that's what I'm doing here in your flat, Miss Harding. After my little adventure, the first thing I did was to call the police. And the second was to come here to call on you, the girl who steered me into that shooting gallery. Well, you needn't sound so annoyed at me. Of course, I advise you to go there, but after all, it was your duty. If you did recover the picture... I almost lost my health doing it for the third time. Really? Yes, really. First, somebody tried to make a sea-going paratrooper out of me. Then they tried to make me part of the pavement by running me down with an auto. And now tonight, somebody on the other side of a door tries to turn it into my personal copy of the Pearly Gate. That's really enough for me. Mr. Dollar... Where is the painting now? At Scotland Yard. And now let's change the subject back. What's bothering me is bothering me plenty. I want to know who didn't want me to find that picture and why. Why, it seems elementary. Thank you, Dr. Watson. The thief naturally didn't want you to find it. Miss Harding, please. When I got shot at, the apparent thief was dead. Well, they do have henchmen, you know. If he was killed by an accomplice, why did the killer leave the painting? Mm, I'd have no way of knowing. Of that, I'm still not sure. Oh, really, Mr. Dollar, come off it. You hardly suspect me. I suspect you left if you'd stop saying that. At this point, I suspect everyone. Even Dexter Morley, for dreaming up this whole painting of the month scheme to bring those paintings within stealing distance. Oh, but that's utterly yes, ridiculous. I know, I know. If that was the plan, he'd wait until he had more than one picture on the road to steal. That's why I don't suspect him. Well, frankly, I don't see why you continue to worry. After all, your part of the job is done, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose you're right. But I still have a yearning burning deep down inside of me to break somebody's neck. Mind if I use your phone? Of course not. Help yourself. Thanks. Hello, I, I want to talk to New York. Oh. Now, don't worry, I'll call Collect. My name is Johnny Dollar. I want to place a Collect call to New York. Number is Plaza 69184. Texas, please, sir. Your name is John Dollar. New York number you're calling is Plaza 69184. And the call is uh, Collect. Correct? Correct. Collect. Right you are, sir. We shall ring up immediately if that's a clear circuit. Thank you. They'll call me. Well, while you're waiting, you should probably do with a break. Did you care for a drink? Mm, what have you got? Oh, gin and orange, gin and lemon, gin and Italian, or gin and French. No whiskey. No, thanks. Well, come and sit down over there. Very restful. What's more restful on the eyes where I am? Here, I can have a better look at you. However... Why, well, Mr. Dolly, you can be charming. Do you mind if I change the mistress of Johnny? Sounds much more fun. I'll swap you one Johnny for every Muriel you let me use. It's a bargain. Now, tell me about yourself. Your line of work fascinates me. I'm an absolute bug on criminologist. At the moment, Muriel, that happens to be my unfavorite subject. Let's talk about you. Mm, where shall I begin? Mm, just after the age of 21? Mm, you're a saucy type. At the age of 21, I was serving in the West. Huh? The Women's Air Force. Oh, you must have had a lot of exciting adventures. Ooh, rather. What was the most exciting? Oh, I think perhaps the night the young U.S. Air Force Captain Fitch. Oh, one of the boys of the wild blue yonder. Maybe it was the blue of your eyes that made him wild. Johnny. I know how he must have felt. Hey, Johnny. Uh, I'll be right back. All right, darling. Hello? Are you there? Are you there? Of course I'm here. Mr. Dollar? That's right. We're ready with your call to New York. The signal at the end of three minutes. Are you ready to talk? The minute you stop. Right you are, sir. Carry on. Hello? Hello? 
Is this the Fine Arts Insurers? I want to talk to Mr. Kimball. Yes, 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 Dollar. I'm on the line. Go ahead. Well, you can stop worrying, Kimball. I got the painting back. You say you did get it back? That's right. It's safe. All you'll have to pay is the price of a new frame. What's that you say? What happened to the frame? Well, the guy who swiped it took the painting out of the frame. I don't know where it is. Well, ask the culprit what he did with it. I can't. He's dead. Well, then, look for it. That frame itself is worth $10,000. It was insured along with the painting. Okay, Fred. Don't blow out any bridge work. I'll look around for it. Yes. You've got dollar. Huh. You're too near doing that already. What do you say? Okay, Fred, I'll cable you what happened. Goodbye. Well, Muriel, vacation's over. I just got put back to work. I gather from your conversation you want to send him chasing off into the night to look for the picture frame. Yeah, that's it. Oh, it's ridiculous. He's probably already found it somewhere in that fellow's flat. I'll check that. But my work is personal service. Mm, but you must have go, Johnny. It's only half past ten. Couldn't you put it off till morning? Well, there's nothing I'd like better, but... Couldn't you stay even for a little while? Well, just long enough to calm my nerves. Big Ben was ringing up midnight on Time's greedy cash register when I finally cleared with a bobby guarding the back alley flat that had not so long before given up one unprecious life and one very precious painting. The place was darker than it had been on my previous visit, and when I groped for the electric switch, I realized why. There had been a brisk fire blazing before. In the bottom grate of the stove, I found enough unburned portions of the hot picture frame to justify my conclusions. And I found something else that came under the category of hot rocks. Rent account item seven. Cab fare to the office of Dexter Morley. The front door was not only locked, it was barred. However, at the back of the building, I had better luck. A loose window down to the basement. I had broken a law, but I didn't want to break my neck, so I sat on a light. The basement was loaded with cabinet-making equipment. But for my dough, they weren't making any cabinets. There was a bench with a power drill, and on the floor below it, a pile of sawdust and wood shavings. That was normal enough, but the sawdust pile was glinting with tiny specks of crystallized glue. With what I had now, all I had to find was Dexter Morley. He made that easy. He found me. Stay down there, Dollar. Right where you are. Well, welcome home from that trip to Paris you didn't take. That gun in your hand suggests that I'm right about one thing anyway. Yes, and what would that be? That whoever took those shots at me earlier tonight was probably not an Englishman. The bobbies over here don't carry guns, which makes most English mugs afraid to. You're an American. That's interesting, but hardly valuable. I've got some more. How valuable is this? I think you're in on, or at the head of, a very high-class smuggling racket. And I think you set up that painting of the month scheme of yours to establish just about the neatest method of smuggling that I've ever heard of. You're very generous, but I know how I operate, so what you could tell me about it could do nothing more than bore me. What I want from you are the diamonds. Maybe I can trade you. Some diamonds for some answers. You're in no position to bargain. Give me the diamonds or I'll shoot you and take them off you. No, wait a minute. I'd better explain my bargaining position. And I think you'll admit it's not the worst. Since you must have followed me here, you know I took a cab from the murder flat. One without a taillight, so you don't have the number. But, brother, I do. And the diamonds are jammed down behind its back seat. Now, let's bargain. Who are you? All right. What do you want to know? Just let me do the guessing. And check me if I'm wrong. You set up a chain of famous paintings which would move around the world through your branch offices. As each one passed through your hands here, the frame was to be dismantled and holes bored in it at the joints for the purpose of smuggling diamonds. Right so far? Yes, Dollar, right. But remember, the more you are right about, the worse it is for me. So naturally, the worse it is for you. We'll take care of that later. This scheme of you is fascinating. The stuff moves around the world in the picture frames under official armed guard and enjoying virtual diplomatic immunity through customs. It's great. Yeah, it would have been great if it hadn't been for that heavy-handed oath. Oh, that fills in a missing link. From out of the night comes a burglar, steals your first loaded picture, shoves the frame into his stove to get rid of it. You arrive, cream him with your gun, then I arrive, interrupting you before you get what you want out of the burning frame, and then... You saw what happened to him when he resisted me, Dollar. But now you must realize that I won't hesitate a moment. It works the other way, doesn't it? You kill me, who tells you the number of that taxi? And without it, you'll never get your diamond. There are ways. Keep your hands behind you. Painful. I thought so. Your head will wear out before this gun barrel does. Now, 
Feel more like talking? Just enough to tell you one more thing. You can tell that blonde accomplice of yours I was on to her from the start. Tony, what do you mean? What? Don't shoot back! I can't repay you for those three tries you made or had made on my life, Morley. But here's what it feels like being hit on the head with a gun. Yeah, rock a booby. Muriel, look out, you'll fall. I told you, that's a very undignified way for a lady to enter a room through a basement window. Johnny, I was only trying to help, and there you were accusing me of being his accomplice. After all those nice things you said to me before. Whoa, wait a minute. Oh, I followed you. I I wanted to see how you were. Oh, great, you and your criminology. At least you might have stepped in before you hit me those two licks. Look at my head. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny. It's just that I love crime. Well, come on. Get up. Oh. Would be a crime if Mr. Worley there woke up and I had to put him back to sleep again before the police got here. Well, what was it all about? It was about these little black things. I've got a pocket full of them. Here, scrape one of them with your fingernail. Oh, glass. Honey, that's the kind of glass a fellow hands his girl when he wants to be engaged to marry her. Johnny, darling, you mean... <clears throat> uh, yes, I mean only that they're diamonds. <laughs> Expense account, item eight, $350. Plain fare out of attempted matrimony by the party of the second part. Item nine, $25. Gift to Muriel Harding. Two books, one on the art of crime, the other on the art of cookery, in the hopes that the latter might attract her to the pursuit of a more womanly hobby. Item 10, 10 cents. Roma Seltzer, purchased upon landing at Gander, Newfoundland. The only thing still fighting me on this case were those Ruffles sprouts I had at dinner in London the night before. Expense account total, $1,563.40. If you find any slight discrepancy in this amount, in my favor, blame it on my confusion and lack of understanding of the international rate of exchange. The only thing I like to exchange at this point is my head with its two new lumps. Wishing you the same, yours, uh... Truly, Johnny Dollar. In just a moment, more about Johnny Dollar. But first... Academy Award winner Jane Wyman comes as guest to the Family Hour of Stars, and Ozzie and Harriet return in triumph to CBS. These are two headline-making events for next Sunday night. Add these two shows to the top comedy of Jack Benny, the feminine charm and dramatic talent of Helen Hayes and Eve Arden, the ace comedy teams of Amos and Andy and Lemon Abner, and CBS Sunday night makes great news. On top of this, there are the notable mystery capers with Sam Spade and the laughter with Life with Luigi and It Pays to be Ignorant. So don't miss a single one of CBS 10 great entertainments next Sunday night when they're heard over most of these same stations. Jack Benny, of course, comes to you over them all. Listen in again next week when CBS brings you Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar with Charles Russell as Johnny. Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dow with music by Mark Warno and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.